Committee will come to order. Uh, at the conclusion of opening statements yesterday, the chair did call up H.R. 3301, and the bill was open for amendment at any point. Uh, the chair recognizes him, himself to offer an amendment, and the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3301 offered by Mr. Upton of Michigan and Mr. Gene Green of Texas. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and I recognize myself for, for, for five minutes uh, in support of the amendment. Uh, I want to say that I'm happy to offer this amendment with my friend and colleague, Gene Green, and appreciate his hard work to convince our colleagues on both sides about this new approach. This approach is a sincere effort to focus a targeted solution to the lessons learned from the Keystone Pipeline. No one can rightfully argue that the current presidential permit process at the State Department is not broken, no matter what side of the climate debate you're on. And for the over 100 operating or proposed oil, natural gas, and electric transmission facilities that CRS has identified crossing the U.S. border of Canada or Mexico, we can do better, and this bill will make us do that. It takes the politics out of what was once a routine decision and puts in place a new certificate of crossing for an oil pipeline or electric, electric transmission line that crosses the U.S. border to our allies, Canada and Mexico. In fact, this amendment simply puts this infrastructure on par with what already happens for natural gas pipelines that cross the border, a common sense and very transparent approach. And yes, this approach includes a full NEPA analysis. In fact, it's exactly the same way that it is handled for other cross-border infrastructure. So let me say it again, it includes a NEPA analysis. We heard the concerns at the subcommittee and we're making that change. In fact, this amendment even says that approvals cannot be done until final NEPA action is complete. Yes, we put a 120-day time frame on that decision, but the clock does not start until after the NEPA is complete, which has no time limits. But our agencies do need to be held accountable, and the timeline is there to end the abuse so that politics and interference, no matter what problem might be out there, no matter what any administration is in office, can no longer dictate over the policy. We also heard the concerns about a standard of review of the original bill. The national security interests of the U.S. and concerns about taking the oil pipeline authority away from the State Department. So in an effort to accommodate our friends, we're making those changes too, giving this targeted authority back to state and moving back to a public interest standard. Why public interest? Well, as we debated last week, the standard is well understood and is the same standard that has been used without problems for decades for approving natural gas cross-border applications under Section 3 of the Natural Gas Act. The public interest standard requires FERC to consider the health and safety of the public environmental impact of the project in the project area, the economic impact of the project, and our commitments to Canada and Mexico in promoting trade. The Department of Energy also uses the public interest standard for approving cross-border transmission segments, requiring this standard for oil pipelines so that all three types of cross-border energy projects can be approved under exactly the same standard is, I think, a common sense policy. Why are we making these changes? John Kerry said it well yesterday. He said, today it's clear the world's new energy map is no longer centered in the Middle East, but in the Western Hemisphere. Or as Senator Pete Domenici and Jason Grumet of the bipartisan Policy Center, and remember Jason Grumet has been a long time presidential uh, Obama advisor. Uh, this bipartisan policy center jointly noted, quote, the entire continent stands to achieve substantial economic, environmental, and security benefits. But we will not realize these opportunities unless we establish the infrastructure needed to create an integrated North American energy sector. Our permitting policies are antiquated and poorly matched to our rapidly evolving needs. The fact that these executive orders do not specify any particular line or standards for making the determination have created a process ill-suited for the country's changing landscape, end quote. Seems pretty clear. 
This issue is just too important to let politics continue to dictate. So we've given in to the request from many on this committee and listened in the interest of trying to solve this problem. And I would therefore hope that my colleagues can all join me in supporting this amendment and the bill on final passage. And, and I would yield uh, the balance of my minute to Mr. Green, then I'll come to you. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll get my time in our order, but I'll, I just want to thank you and your staff uh, for working with us on this legislation. It's actually been a real compromise, I think much more so than some of us on our side of the aisle would, would feel. Um, obviously, Keystone is important to the area I represent in the Gulf Coast because we have the refineries. But it's important to our country because Canada has always been our, our closest ally, except, you know, back in 1812 when we burned their capital. Uh, but they burned ours, so it was equal. But, uh, but it's so important, and that's why we need to make sure we structuralize our uh, free trade agreement between our two closest neighbors, uh, Mexico and Canada. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I would recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll support this amendment because it would partially address some of the bill's major problems, but there are still significant problems with the bill. For decades, the federal government has decided whether to approve a cross-border pipeline or transmission line based on whether the proposed project is broadly in the public interest. As drafted, H.R. 3301 tossed out that standard and replaced it with a much narrower standard. The relevant federal agency would have to approve a project unless it finds that the project is not in the national security interests of the United States. By tying approval of a project to a national security standard rather than a broader public interest or national interest standard, the bill would prevent federal agencies from considering the many ways a pipeline or a transmission project could affect communities and landowners uh, along the project's route, energy markets, the environment, the climate, other ways the project could have a real impact on people's lives. The Upton and Green Amendment would fix this problem by allowing federal agencies to consider factors other than national security interests. So that's an improvement. The original bill included a two-pronged assault on effective environmental review of cross-border oil and natural gas pipelines and transmission lines. First, the bill explicitly stated that approval of cross-border pipelines and transmission lines shall not constitute a major federal action for purposes of a National Environmental Policy Act. And second, the bill set an arbitrary 120-day deadline for agencies to approve projects, which is simply not enough time to perform an adequate environmental review. Either one of these provisions would effectively eliminate federal environmental review of cross-border projects. This amendment would delete the language that explicitly exempts these, exempts these projects from NEPA review, and it would start a 120-day deadline after NEPA review is complete. But it creates a new problem for environmental review. Under this amendment, instead of conducting an environmental review of the entire length of a pipeline that crosses the border with Canada or Mexico, the NEPA review would be limited to just the small segment of the pipeline crossing the border. That's a dramatic narrowing of the federal environmental review for oil pipelines. For example, under this amendment, the environmental review of the Keystone XL pipeline would only examine the environmental impacts of the little piece of the pipeline that crosses the border with Canada, not the impacts on climate change and moving all of that tar sands oil through the middle of the United States, not the impacts on aquifers or landowners in Nebraska, not the potential public safety or oil spill concerns. The new language is just another way of gutting the federal environmental review for tar sands pipelines. There are other major, major problems with the bill, even if this amendment passes. The bill would still create a rebuttable presumption that Keystone XL and other tar sands pipelines are in the public interest, tipping the scale in favor of their approval. And if the president rejects 
Keystone XL or another pipeline because it's not in the national interest, the bill would still allow the rejected applicant to reapply under the new, much weaker process. The bill also continues to exempt major expansions of existing pipelines and reversals of pipeline flows from any approval process at all. And the bill would still allow for unlimited exports of liquefied natural gas through Canada and Mexico with absolutely no controls or conditions. It is fine to adopt this amendment, but I urge my colleagues to continue to oppose this unwise legislation. Gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none. Oh, gentlelady lady from uh, Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, colleagues, this amendment includes some language uh, that is similar to an amendment I offered during the subcommittee markup that where it was rejected. I was planning to offer a similar amendment today to ensure that approval of these cross-boundary projects have to meet a public interest standard. As drafted, H.R. 3301 exempts many cross-border pipelines and transmission pro projects from the requirement for a presidential permit and changes the permitting criteria for the remainder. Specifically, the bill replaces the requirement that a project be in the public interest or national interest with the requirement that the project be approved unless it is not in the national security interest of the United States. And of course, this would dramatically narrow what can be considered in evaluating these projects to just national security concerns. Of course, national security is a critical consideration, but national security is not the only consideration at stake, and it certainly is not the only thing that matters to states and our local communities. This amendment fixes this problem by broadening the standard for approval from a national security test to a public interest test. That will allow federal agencies to examine the potential impact of these major projects on environmental uh, matters, local concerns, climate change, property rights, pipeline safety, and other important areas of consideration. But this amendment, unfortunately, does not fix other core problems of the bill. The bill still eliminates effective environmental review of major cross-boundary energy projects by narrowing the scope of the review to just the part of the project that crosses the border. And the bill still provides a way for controversial tar sands pipelines, including Keystone, to slip through the back door for approval, even if the administration determines that those pipelines are not in the national interest. Um, this bill creates a presumption that Keystone and other projects are in the national interest, and that is a subtle but significant change that makes it almost a guarantee that these projects will be approved, even if the record is complete and there are uh, dramatic concerns remaining. So while I appreciate my colleagues now agree that we should fix one of the big problems with the bill, the bill still would do more harm than good. So I urge my colleagues to continue to oppose the bill. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? The chair would recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and like I said earlier, I appreciate the, uh, the effort to uh, to work together on this uh, uh, substitute. Today in North America, we find an unprecedented opportunity. More than two decades after we signed NAFTA, the United States, Canada, and Mexico are at a crossroads once again. In 2015, the United States, through hydraulic fracking, will produce more oil and gas than any other nation. Canada is developing resources that would solidify them as the number one supplier of crude oil for the United States. Mexico has undergone major changes in their energy sector and they're on the brink of an energy rev revolution. Many have spoken about the benefits of a united North American energy sector. Secretary Kerry spoke about this yesterday. Others, including the Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs, the Washington Post Editorial Board, the Wall Street Journal, and dozens of former Republican and Democrat administration officials have touted the importance of North American energy. To accomplish this, we need cross-border infrastructure. Believe it or not, the State Department has issued cross-border permits before without much fanfare. The last permit in 2009, the State Department issued stating additional crude oil pipeline capacity will advance the number of strategic interests in the United States. Approval of such a sends a positive economic signal about the future reliability and availability of U.S. energy imports and will provide construction jobs for uh, workers in the U.S. 
in, in their own national interest determination, the department said, the U.S. will continue to reducing GHGs while conservation and energy efficiency measures like CAFE. Unfortunately, shortly after that, the politics of pipeline decisions and the use of NEPA as a tool of obstruction began. In 2010, when the State Department released its first NEPA analysis of the Keystone XL, the draft was rejected and departments requested to better assess how can Canadian policy decisions could affect U.S. energy and climate policy objectives. The State Department has further requested to address potential oil demand scenarios over the 50-year life of the project. It's important to recognize that the State Department's previous analysis cross-border projects did not include these assessments. The Keystone analysis was supposed to include extraction process, transportation, construction, and activities that occur on the Canadian side of the border. As I mentioned in my opening statement yesterday, the Obama administration has indicated these are not activities intended for assessment under the NEPA. Proponents of H.R. 3301 understand the importance of GHG emissions and their effect on climate change, but it's important to identify the reality of the situation, especially as if we are to assess Canadian policies. Canada has the right to develop their natural resources found within their borders. As, their own num as our number one supplier of crude oil, Canada would prefer to send that commodity to the United States. And as a sideline, five refineries that are in eastern Harris County in or near our district were tooled in the 90s to handle heavy Venezuelan crude. We would much rather have that heavier crude coming from Canada. However, that does not mean they should stop developing if the U.S. is not capable of meeting Canadian needs. In fact, I think my colleagues from California might want to support H.R. 3301. California imports a majority of its oil. If we do not meet the transportation needs of the Canadian energy sector, they will export that oil to China to dirtier refineries and then import it back to California. Currently, North American transportation needs are being met by trains and trucks. This is because of NAFTA. Commodities can enter our country by way of rail or road because of the existing free trade agreement. Rails and highways are built with a focused NEPA review. Pipelines are needed to fully utilize the potential of the North American energy. And I've said it before, I can have a thousand car train filled with Canadian crude and bring it across the border right now without a permit. But to build a pipeline, it takes us five years to get a permit. It's estimated that the industry will invest $200 billion by 2035 in energy infrastructure. In 2013, 2 million jobs were created and sustained by 2.27 trillion in exports led by energy. If proponents of, the HR, opponents of H.R. 3301 are concerned about GHG, keep in mind that 34% of our emissions come from transportation sector. If, if opponents of H.R. 3301 are concerned about safety, know that from 2009 to 2013, rail cars carrying oil increased from 10,000 cars to 400,000 cars. However, 3301 is not about rail versus pipeline. Rail is needed now more than ever, even to move more commodities and people around our country. The demand is simply too high for rail to handle all the energy transportation needs. That's why H.R. 3301 is a, par is a parity. Pipelines are being disadvantaged due to an ill-defined process promulgated by executive order. H.R. 3301 creates definition. The amended legislation would structuralize the application and approval process for cross-border facilities. The bill sets forth reasonable timelines of 120 days after the NEPA process has been completed by the Department of State to issue a public interest determination. For those who are concerned about limited national security tests, we've addressed that. For those who are concerned about the brief timeline, we've addressed that. For those who desire a federal NEPA review for the first time, we will codify in law a NEPA review for cross-border pipelines. For those who want the State Department to review Canadian policies in 50 years of what-if scenarios, we don't do that in 3301, even the hopefully amended version. But 3301 aims to resolve an issue. There are 10 cross-border facilities waiting for approval. Some have waited two years just for the change of names. To maximize the benefits and capitalize on the opportunity to secure our energy supplies now and in the future, we must provide that the Department of State with direction. H.R. 3301 does this while protecting public interest in the environment. And I urge you to support the Upton Green Amendment, and I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seen none. If there's no further discussion, 
The vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor so signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent at this point that the Upton Green Amendment be considered as the base tax for any further amendments to H.R. 3301, so ordered. I also ask that all technical and conforming changes necessary be made in order uh, without objection agreed to as well. Are there are other amendments to H.R. 3301. Gentleman from California. Just I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title. Amendment to H.R. 3301 offered by Mr. McNerney of California. Without objection, the, uh, the amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment. And the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under current law, if a company wants to export natural gas, it must first obtain approval from the Department of Energy. <clears throat> Excuse me. For, company, for countries without free trade agreement with the United States, the DOE examines whether the proposed export is in the public interest. For, con for countries with a free trade agreement with the United States, including Canada and Mexico, the DOE is required to deem export applications consistent with the public interest and grant them without delay. The DOE testified that these applications are relatively simple filings and that the department responds within two to four weeks of a request. The approvals can include conditions such as prohibitions against simply using Canada or Mexico as a pass-through before shipping gas to another country. Section 4 of the bill would modify this straightforward approval process for LNG exports to Canada <clears throat> and Mexico. The bill amends current law to completely exempt a company exporting natural gas to Canada or Mexico from any approval at all. This unnecessary change would have significant consequences. Under the bill, the DOE would no longer be able to include any conditions on the approvals. As a result, the bill allows unrestricted exports of LNG to Canada or Mexico, and from there it could be re-exported to any other country. These unlimited LNG exports <clears throat> through Canada and Mexico would no longer be subject to any DOE approval, review, or conditions. There would be no public interest determinations or analyses of impacts on domestic natural gas prices and the American consumers and manufacturers. <clears throat> Canada and Mexico are two of our most important allies and trading partners, and we can easily send them natural gas. Now, there's no reason to allow for uncontrolled and unlimited LNG exports through Canada and Mexico. My amendment strikes Section 4 of this bill, thereby eliminating the language that allows unlimited LNG exports to any destination with any public interest determination. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman yields back. Chair would recognize himself uh, for five minutes in opposition to the amendment. I would just note that uh, because of NAFTA, the U.S. does have free trade agreements, we know, with both Canada and Mexico. Currently, under the Natural Gas Act, the company has to apply import or export natural gas to free trade agreements and those applications shall be granted without modifications or delay. That's the language. So we've been importing and exporting natural gas to and from Mexico and Canada for over 80 years. Uh, I know that it's been beneficial to all, these all three countries for decades. Uh, it should be encouraged, not stifled. In fact, according to EIA, 20% of Californians' natural gas indeed comes from Canada. So nothing in this bill as amended removes the ability of FERC to regulate the operation of the pipeline, especially if a company doesn't comply with the terms of their Natural Gas Act, Section 3 approval. Nothing in the legislation limits the President's power to stop natural gas exports under the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, and nothing in H.R. 3301 limits EIA's ability to collect data on exports from pipeline uh, operators under 15 U.S. Code 772B. So Section 4 of this bill of 3301 is a small step towards bringing our nation's energy policy in line with, uh, with, with the world that we live in today, and I would ask that our members oppose the amendment. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment, on the, amendment the chair would recognize the gentleman from California. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I urge support uh, for the McNerney Amendment. If you look at what happened last week, 
uh, the committee marked up a bill to allow for unlimited LNG exports without any determination that they would be in the public interest. And members raised a lot of concerns about the impacts of unlimited LNG exports on natural, on domestic natural gas prices, about the effects of higher prices uh, on American consumers and manufacturers. The bill we reported out had major problems, but the proponents of that bill backed away from automatically approving uh, unlimited LNG exports. This bill, H.R. 3301, brings us right back to where we started. Section 4 of this bill would allow for unlimited LNG exports to any destination in the world without any public interest determination or analysis of the potential impacts. As long as the LNG exports first go to Canada or Mexico, no approval is required. An LNG tanker ship could leave Louisiana or Texas, pause in Mexico, and then ha head off to Asia, completely bypassing existing legal requirements. This provision is also unnecessary because Canada and Mexico have no problems obtaining U.S. natural gas for their own use. We have a free trade agreement with them, and approval of exports to Canada and Mexico is quick and automatic. But the Department of Energy is able to watch those exports to make sure they are not diverted to other countries. Uh, this provision eliminates DOE's ability to watch out for American consumers and manufacturers. We should strike Section 4 of the bill. That's what McNerney, Mr. McNerney's amendment uh, does. I think it's a good amendment. It's consistent with the committee's actions last week, and I would encourage all members to support it. Chairman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Other amendments to the bill? Gentleman from the, no, not yet. Uh, other members to the bill? Chair would recognize gentleman. Does the gentleman from Vermont have an amendment at the desk? Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will uh, read the title. Amendment to the Upton Green Amendment to H.R. 3301 offered by Mr. Welch of Vermont. And without objection, the amendment is uh, considered as read, and the gentleman from Vermont is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 3301 has a number of problems. One very serious concern to me is that under this bill, there'll be literally no federal review at all for projects that make major changes to existing cross-border pipelines. Uh, the bill, as you know, uh, provides a blanket exemption from federal review for every pipeline modification, no matter how large, how significant, uh, or how controversial. And the modifications can be huge, multi-billion dollar projects with significant safety health, environmental, and economic impacts in communities along the pipeline. And we can certainly in this uh, committee, in this Congress, have a big debate about whether a project should or should not go forward. But should we have legislation that denies the citizens in our communities the opportunity to weigh in and participate in the permit process when the project is going to have significant implications uh, for their communities? You know, under current law, Many of these projects that will sail through uh, generally need a revised presidential permit and potentially an environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act. And this does ensure that project impacts are understood, allows public participation, allows the federal government to set permit conditions, including safety measures that are necessary to protect landowners. Under this bill, H.R. 3301, all of these safeguards would be extinguished. The bill exempts all pipeline modifications uh, from the requirement to obtain a presidential permit. This should alarm and does alarm communities that are traversed by cross-border pipelines. Uh, and it's a very significant concern for citizens in my home state of Vermont. Uh, Vermont is home to a stretch of uh, the Portland-Montreal pipeline. And that was built to transport light sweet crude oil from Maine across New Hampshire and Vermont to Montreal, Canada. And there are growing indications now uh, that some intend to reverse the flow of this pipeline to transport 600,000 barrels a day of Canadian tar sands crude in the other direction, from Canada across Vermont to the coast of Maine. 
Now that raises a lot of concerns uh, to people in my community uh, as well as uh, other states. Uh, for one, a spill of that heavy tar sands oil would cause incredible damage, much worse than anything that could occur with a spill of light sweet crude. Vermonters are further concerned that reversing the, uh, the pipeline will accelerate the, the, the development of the Canadian tar sands. And again, we can have a debate about that. We, can have, we do have different points of view on that. But should anybody be denied the opportunity of public participation in that debate? Forty-two of the towns and municipalities in my state of Vermont have passed resolutions opposing this project. Let's let them have a hearing in the existing permit process. But H.R. 3301 would require no federal review at all. It's a blanket exemption. And it's as though by exempting from consideration any issues related to environment or health or safety, there aren't issues of environment or health and safety. And it would be a great world if that's all it took. We passed a law saying there shall be no spills. But it doesn't work that way. The bill sponsors say that it makes no sense to require a presidential permit review for changes in pipeline ownership. I agree with that. My amendment would still exempt all such minor modifications to existing projects. But major modifications, uh, such as increasing a pipeline's volume, expanding its physical infrastructure, or reversing its flow can and do pose significant risk. Under my amendment, major modifications would continue to be subject to federal review Information on project impacts would be developed and the public would not be shut out. Uh, this won't fix all the problems of the bill, but it's a significant improvement, and I urge all members to support my amendment. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair would recognize himself for five minutes. I would just say to the gentleman from Vermont, I appreciate uh, your amendment. Uh, we didn't see it until last night. It was not um, considered um, in the subcommittee markup or hearing that we had before. I would... Yes, uh, I understand your concerns, uh, and I'm willing to work with the gentleman. This amendment we can't accept the way that it is, uh, particularly as it, uh, as it relates to the definition of what is a minor modification. And I would perhaps ask the gentleman if he might withdraw the amendment, uh, and we will in earnest uh, try to work with the gentleman bet bet uh, between the time this bill gets scheduled for the floor. It's not going to be up for prob probably at least a month. Uh, and give us a, a little time to perhaps um, to work on a proposal that we both can accept. But in, in current form, we can't accept it, and the uh, gentleman is entitled to do whatever he wants. But I'd, I'd just make that offer if the, if, uh, the gentleman might withdraw it and, and will work in, in good faith. Uh, you know what, Mr. Chairman? If you say you'll work in good faith, no, uh, you will work in good faith. Yeah. So I'm willing to take that uh, and proposal. Would the chairman yield? Yes. Yeah, I'll be glad. Who, who, just for a second. Uh, Chair, yeah, you the gentleman from Illinois. I just want to include, I, there is a problem with the vague language of modern, um, uh, minor modifications. Um, and I, I'm learning that we need to be very, very careful with vague language. What, you know, there's, there is this debate about the imperial presidency, whether it's Obama or Bush. How powerful can the executive branch get? And they get powerful because we're vague. So I would encourage the chairman to work with you to boil down that portion of the language. There is great concern that it's too vague for us to understand what that means. It's my, my, I'll yield uh, to the gentlelady from California. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your willingness to, um, uh, uh, to work with Mr. Welch. I support his amendment. Um, there are two really very basic things in the public square, and that is public health and public safety. And uh, there's a lot of talk about regulations and what they do and whether we should have them and that, but around public health and public safety, no matter what place you go in this country, people will stand next to that. And contained in this amendment, Mr. Chairman, are really those two bookends. And so I'm encouraged that you will work with Mr. Welch uh, because I think uh, uh, that's really what the amendment is about. And uh, I don't think that's vague. I think that that is uh, really, uh, I had some really terrific talking points on this, but since you're, ta you're, going to, you're willing to work with him, I won't go through all of this. But public health and public safety, um, uh, uh, we're, we are the ones that need to step up 
and assure the American people in each one of our districts that we've addressed that. So thank you for yielding time to me on it. Uh, and in my, uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time. A gentleman from California is recognized. Yeah, thanks. Time. I didn't need the, the full five minute, uh, minutes. It looks like uh, the amendment's going to be withdrawn, and we'll work on it. I just want to emphasize why it's important to work out this amendment, because uh, if we exempt all modifications uh, from federal review, I, I think some of these modifications amount to uh, a, uh, a whole new project, and uh, they need to be examined. Uh, I, I would just want to underscore that when we have these promises to work with us in committee, that there actually be a negotiation. Uh, the chairman expressed concern that hadn't, they hadn't seen your amendment, Mr. Welch's amendment, before last night. Well, we never saw a lot of things that are before us today except for an hour or two before the markup. So let's try to establish a, a, a complete communications and negotiation. I think we could do a lot of good that way, and I think it's important to work out this amendment because it's an important amendment to have in the bill. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Does the gentleman wish to withdraw? Do you want to proceed? Uh, yeah, uh, in view of your uh, assurances yeah. that you'll yeah, work in will. good faith with us, I will withdraw. But I do want to say uh, the more we can work together on some of these tough issues, the better. Uh, in getting things, amendments to you sooner, the bill to us sooner, I think that helps us, Mr. Chairman. So thanks for your willingness to work with us on that. And I look forward to seeing if we can make some progress. And yep. I will withdraw my amendment. With uh, By unanimous consent, the amendment is withdrawn. Are there further amendments to the bill? Gentlemen from California is recognized. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report Number the title. Three. Amendment to the Upton Green Amendment to H.R. 3301 offered by Mr. Waxman of California. And the amendment will be considered as read and the staff will distribute the amendment and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've been told that this bill is not about approving Keystone XL Tar Sands Pipeline. Unfortunately, this bill meddles once again in the administration's decision-making process on Keystone XL. In fact, if the State Department rejects Keystone XL, this bill would allow the project to reapply to a new decision-maker under a new process designed to rubber stamp permits. H.R. 3301 establishes a new permitting process that aims to assure rapid approval of every cross-border pipeline or transmission project. The adopted Upton Green Amendment doesn't change the fact that this bill would make it very difficult for federal agencies to do anything other than approve the proposed projects. The bill still has a rebuttable presumption of approval. It narrows the environmental analysis under NEPA to just the cross-border portion of the proposed project, even though these energy projects could have widespread impacts. The bill excludes from this new permitting process any project with permit approval pending on the date of enactment. But that exclusion operates only for a limited time. The exclusion ends as soon as a pending project has been denied or for any still pending project. The exclusion ends as of July 1, 2016. Currently pending projects would become subject to the new permitting process as soon as the exclusion ends. If a decision has not been made on Keystone XL by July 1, 2016, the pipeline would then proceed under the new process, and it likely would be approved by November 1, 2016. And if President Obama finds that Keystone XL pipeline is not in the public interest and denies the permit under the bill, the project could be brought back to life, spring, spring right back to life. TransCanada could reapply, this time to the Commerce Department, under the new criteria. The project might be approved by November 1, 2015, just a year and a half from now. That's why I call this the Zombie Pipeline Act. I find it particularly troubling that this bill would force the administration to allow a second bite at the apple for a pipeline that the administration had already found contrary to the public interest. Keystone XL is a massive multi-billion dollar project that will seize land from thousands of American landowners and transport a hazardous substance across the United States for the benefit 
of a foreign country. The project will facilitate more rapid expansion of the tar sands, the dirtiest source of crude oil crude available with respect to carbon pollution. This project will be in place for 50 to 100 years, and its effects could last even longer. Yet even if the President finds that permitting the Keystone XL pipeline is not in the best interest of the American people, H.R. 3301 won't take no for an answer. My amendment fixes only one of the many problems with this bill, and even if it's adopted, I will still oppose the bill, absent other changes. But this amendment asks the bill's sponsors to put their money where their mouth is. If you want to leave Keystone XL alone, you need to provide a real exemption for pending projects. And that's all my amendment would do. It doesn't affect any other aspect of the bill. Whether you support or oppose Keystone XL, this amendment would simply leave the decision to the current process. And if H.R. 3301 is really about driving approval of every proposed pipeline, including Keystone XL, then you should oppose my amendment. But if you vote no, please don't try to tell us this bill isn't about Keystone XL. So I urge uh, support for this amendment. Jim, gentleman yields back and showed recognize himself uh, in opposition to the amendment. Now I would note that there are more than a dozen applications that are currently pending, not only for new oil pipeline presidential permits, but also for natural gas pipelines and transmission lines. So the unintended consequence of this amendment would mean that projects that could bring more electricity to states like New York and New Hampshire and other states would forever be barred from being approved. According to CRS, there are currently two applications pending for natural gas pipelines, four applications pending for new transmission lines, and one application pending for a new oil pipeline. There are many more applications pending for new presidential permits for existing projects across both borders that would be impacted by the amendment, and that is why I would urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. Other members wishing to speak, on the chair would recognize the gentleman from New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support Mr. Waxman's amendment. Uh, this amendment simply makes H.R. 3301 do no more or no less than what its supporters say they want it to do, to establish a new process for permitting cross-border pipelines and transmission lines. That new process should apply prospectively. If instead the bill gets bogged down in picking winners and losers in current controversies, we won't be able to have a real conversation about what the new permit process should look like. Consideration of this bill, as with many, so many of this committee's hearings, markups, and floor time over the past few years, will continue to be all about the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline. There are Democratic members on both sides of the Keystone XL pipeline issue. But most of us agree that whether we support or oppose that pipeline, the decision should be made based on sound analysis and certainly on the best interests of this nation. That's why most of us opposed previous bills in this committee to set an arbitrary deadline for a decision or to simply approve the pipeline. H.R. 3301 limits the administration's existing authority over the Keystone XL pipeline. It purports to exempt the pending projects such as Keystone XL from the new permit process established under the bill. But Keystone XL is only exempt if the President approves the project and does so before July 1st of 2016. After that date, H.R. 3301 provides that Keystone XL would be subject to the new permitting process. And if the President rejects Keystone XL, TransCanada could apply, or excuse me, reapply and would be subject to the new permitting process even sooner, as of July 1 of 2015. My colleagues across the aisle say they don't intend this bill to be about Keystone XL, and I take them at their word. They say they just want Congress to set up a process for approval of cross-border energy projects. Unfortunately, the text of this bill doesn't match their intent. So let's vote for Mr. Waxman's amendment and take Keystone XL out of this discussion and I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this amendment, and I yield back, Mr. Chair. Chairman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the amendment offered by Mr. Waxman. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Aye. No. Opinion, Chair, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll.
Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Gingry. No. Mr. Gingry votes no. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mrs. McMorse Rogers. Mrs. McMorse Rogers votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes no. Mr. Olson. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Bilirakis. Mr. Bilirakis votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Long votes no. Mrs. Elmers. Mrs. Elmers votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Ingle. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget votes aye. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Yarmouth votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. Other members wishing to cast a vote? Uh, Dr. Murphy? Dr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Pompeo? No. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Olson? No. Mr. Olson votes no. Other members wishing to cast a vote? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Gentlemen, hold just for one second. Okay. The gentleman recorded, right? I have an amendment that I'd yeah, like to offer. Just wait till we, we do this vote, and then we'll, I'll recognize you. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 16 ayes and 27 nays. 16 ayes, 27 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, are there further amendments to the bill? The chair would recognize the gentleman from the great state of Michigan. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I begin by uh, well, the gentleman, commending you for the fairness, I, for the fairness in which you have engaged here today. I have an amendment which I offer at this particular time. The clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment. The I ask unanimous consent that the reading of the amendment be dispensed. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is, is uh, completed. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman from the great state of Michigan is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. While the amendment is being passed out, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, begin by thanking both you and Mr. Green for your introduction to the legislation. I believe you've made a very serious and sincere effort to address the uncertainties surrounding the process. And while I appreciate your efforts to find a middle ground, I continue to have concerns about this bill. As the House author of NEPA, NEPA years, years ago, I can tell you that it was created to provide transparency so that people would know what the impact of a project would be on their communities and upon their lives. However, H.R. 3301 will circumvent that transparency, making our lands vulnerable to spills, leaks, and other pipeline hazards. You and I have recently had an experience, Mr. Chairman, with what happens when there is uh, carelessness in the operation of a pipeline or when there is a spill or some kind of unfortunate event associated with the operation of the pipeline. Uh, I want to, this amendment is offered so that we can make certain that proper diligence is given to protect the public's interest. And I've observed that the long-term lasting effect of a spill from a pipeline is a very serious matter, particularly in our area, the Great Lakes, 
but also in other areas, and that, that an explosion of a pipeline can be an event of great seriousness to all concerned. Now, we are, we are here trying at this amendment to see to it that NEPA review is conducted for the entire length of all cross-border projects. We can guarantee all proposals will get the full scope of review necessary to preserve and protect our precious natural resources, particularly we who live at the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, H.R. 3301 falls short of this. Uh, and I would note that the bill would limit NEPA review to cross-border segments of an oil pipeline. I'm not altogether clear what that is, whether it's a couple of millimeters or a couple of inches or maybe a few feet. But it is a serious matter and does require very clear understanding of what it is we're doing to ourselves and the risks and dangers that are attendant upon this matter. If H.R. 3301 were to become law, a federal NEPA review would not be triggered for the entire length of a cross-border oil pipeline. There's also a NEPA exemption for modifications made to cross-border segments. In other words, if a company wanted to build a small cross-border segment and triple that in size a year later, those modifications would be exempted from undergoing a federal NEPA review. Furthermore, the definition of a cross-border segment is left geographically vague, and no one, I think, here can tell us what that means. Would NEPA review of a cross-border segment cover inches, yards, miles? I fear that this lack of congressional guidance coupled with the NEPA exemptions to modifications and the unclarity or the lack of clarity here has an extremely dangerous potential for those of us who are concerned about pipeline safety and about protection of treasures like the Great Lakes, which constitute some 20 percent of the water, the world's fresh water supply. And of course, all the tremendous hunting and fishing areas that belong there. Not too long ago, we had a serious problem, as you will recall, with an oil pipeline leaking approximately a million gallons down 35 miles of the Kalamazoo River. My concern is that if this pipeline had been crossing the Detroit River or the St. Clair River, what would have happened? If a pipeline were to leak oil into one of these rivers, it would flow down the St. Clair River down 28 miles of the Detroit River, past my district and into Lake Erie. Along the way, it would, ex it would affect state and federal lands in Michigan and Ohio, Canada, and the rest of the Great Lakes Basin. It would also have a significant adverse potential on fish, wildlife, the health of our people, and of course also the risk to people who would be dependent on that for water and water supplies. Oil, electric, and natural gas projects create a lot of good American jobs. And I want to see to it that when we do these things, we do them carefully so that we're not setting ourselves up with some kind of awful consequences because we didn't do this thing carefully enough in the beginning. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my Gentlemen, gentlemen, back, and I just uh, recognize myself for, for five minutes in opposition to the amendment. I just want to say I appreciate the gentleman's kind words, and yes, uh, we did work very closely together, the two of us, and really every member of this committee, when we enacted, uh, saw the enactment signed by President Obama on the pipeline safety bill uh, in the last sessions of Congress, uh, which, which remains in effect today and uh, will be reauthorized, I believe, uh, uh, next year or so. But what I'm concerned about with this amendment is that you're asking for a federal siting authority for oil pipelines, which does not currently exist, would also trigger federal uh, eminent domain authority. Uh, this bill, H.R. 3301, is estab establishment of a certificate of crossing for the cross-border segment of a project in corresponding federal review is aligned with FERC and DOE precedent for approving cross-border natural gas pipelines and certain electricity 
electric transmission facilities, but when a natural gas pipeline operator applies for a cross-border natural gas pipeline approval under Section 3 of the Natural Gas Act, it triggers a NEPA review on the border facilities. And although FERC is given discretion on the precise boundaries, it's understood that this is a border facility and the NEPA focus is on that area. If a company also applies for Section 7 interstate pipeline permit, then the NEPA uh, extends to cover that too. So uh, I don't think this amendment is, is uh, necessary at all, and I would urge my colleagues to respectfully uh, oppose it and uh, would yield back the balance of my time, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I disagree with you, and I do support the Dingle Amendment. The uh, underlying bill, H.R. 3301, makes an end run around NEPA. Uh, the Upton Green Amendment purports to fix the bill's NEPA problems, but unfortunately these changes are only cosmetic. Uh, the amendment simply finds a new way to eliminate any meaningful review of the environmental impacts of large transboundary infrastructure projects. So under the Upton Green Amendment, which is now has been adopted, and that's part of the bill, we redefine and significantly narrow the scope of NEPA's environmental review. While NEPA review is supposed to look at the impacts of an entire project, the Upton Green Amendment restricts NEPA review to only that small portion of a project that physically crosses the border. That just doesn't make any sense. These massive projects are more than just a border crossing. When we approve a transboundary pipeline or transmission line, we're approving multi-billion dollar infrastructure that may stretch hundreds of miles and will last for decades. These projects pass through private property and sensitive lands and over aquifers. They transport hazardous substances that if spilled or ignited can cause serious damage. Before making decisions about whether to approve such projects, we need to carefully consider their potential impacts on the environment and on communities along the route. And we should be looking at the effects of the project as a whole. That's not what the Upton Green Amendment provides. And I think the Dingle Amendment corrects this problem. It doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't cure all the issues with the legislation itself, but I think uh, it's an important amendment and I would urge its support. Gentleman yields back. Other mem uh, gentleman, the chair would recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I respectfully disagree. I think the Upton um, and Green Amendment does exactly what it says it's going to do. And, you know, because some opponents have tried to claim the bill exempts cross border energy infrastructure from all environmental laws and permitting requirements, including NEPA. That's just not true. However, the amendment to the bill preserves NEPA. That's exactly what. Uh, Upton Green did. Specific, it provides a certificate of crossing cannot be issued until final NEPA action has been taken. Moreover, the bill as revised does not limit the time. I wish it did. My preference would be that there be a limited time and that we would move expeditiously, but this bill and Upton Green has no shot clock uh, on the cross-border segment. Nothing in this bill would limit the application of NEPA to the rest of the project so, for example, if a project requires a right-of-way across federal lands, NEPA would likely apply to the right-of-way approval. Uh, I could go on longer, but um, for the record, uh, you know, that needs to be placed, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Other members, uh, Chair would recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Mr. Doyle. <laughs> I look... The gentleman Mr. From Doyle from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. <laughs> okay, I need you don't don't confuse with me with being from Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Dingle. The gentleman for his kindness to me, and I think both my good friend, the chairman, and, and my dear friend, Mr. Shimkus, have made the case. First of all, there is now not adequate protection with regard to oil pipelines. This would assure that there, that there is no new protection for oil pipelines and that oil pipelines continue to hold the inherent lack of safety which is there. 
And the result is, and I'm just talking about the Great Lakes. My two colleagues over there both understand the Great Lakes because they come from the Great Lakes Basin. The result of a major pipeline event causing the pipelines to leak enormous sums of uh, enormous amounts of oil. And remember, this is going to be a huge pipeline into the Great Lakes Basin could have an appalling consequences on fish, wildlife, and on water supply, on industry and recreation, and on the people's enjoyment up there. It also can impact, for example, things like drinking water and things of that kind. I hope that the members of this committee will understand how important it is that we do the things that we have to to see to it that we protect these treasures. The Great Lakes are 20% of the, of the world's fresh water. And to simply lightly go on and say, well, we don't protect them now, so we're not going to protect them in the future, is, I think, an extremely unwise and dangerous statement of philosophy or the effect that's going to impact our people. This is no small matter. We just had a small pipeline uh, break up there in the district, uh, rather in the general area that's served by my dear friend, the chairman of the committee and I. And it caused no end of fuss and it's gonna cause no end of problems in terms of getting that mess cleaned up. And the consequences to fish, wildlife, water, recreation, uh, industry, and public health are very serious. And understand also that this is not going, that the bill is not going to provide the necessary assurance and protection that are necessary with regard to natural gas and other things. These are matters of the utmost importance. And I would just point out any member of this committee that is going to confront the fact that he has he or she has not properly protected the great treasures that we have of water and fish and wildlife and recreation and municipal and industrial water supplies is going to have a very, very serious problem, both with his conscience and with his politics. I would urge the adoption of the amendment. I would like to have it go further, but regrettably, this is about as far as I could do it with the germaneness rules and the other problems. Now, I want to thank my good friend from Pennsylvania. He's been so kind to me on so many, on many occasions. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I said what I said with regard to you and, and our colleague, Mr. Schiffers, with a great deal of affection and respect. I know yield that. back, Mr. Chairman. I know that. Uh, gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the Dingle Amendment. Though, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Pitts, Mr. Pitts votes no. Mr. Walden, Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Blackburn, Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Gingry, Mr. Gingry votes no. Mr. Scalise, Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Latta, Mr. Latta votes no. Mrs. McMorse Rogers, Mrs. McMorse Rogers votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes no. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes no. Mr. Olson. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Bill Rockus. Mr. Bill Rockus votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Long votes no. Mrs. Elmers. Mrs. Elmers votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Ingle. Mr. Ingle votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. Get. 
Mr. Gett votes aye. Mrs. Capps? Mrs. Capps votes aye. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky? Mr. Matheson? Aye. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Butterfield? Aye. Mr. Barrow? Aye. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Ms. Matsui? Aye. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Ms. Christensen? Ms. Castor? Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. McNerney? Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Braley? Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welsh? Mr. Welsh votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Yarmouth votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. Other members wishing to cast a vote? No. Gentleman, uh, Mr. Olson? No. Mr. Olson votes no. Ms. Schakowsky? Yes. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Dr. Murphy? Mr. Murphy votes no. Other members seeking to cast a vote? Mr. Barton? No, 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 it's the Dingle Amendment. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Barton no. votes no. I was answering this question. Other members wishing to cast a vote on the Dingle Amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Oh, Dr. Burgess, are you recorded? Is there any case coming in? Oh, Mr. Butterfield? Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Other members? Uh, Mr. Kinzinger? Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Dr. Burgess? No. Dr. Burgess votes no. One, other members? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 21 ayes and 20, 29 nays. 21 ayes, 29 nays. The amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 3301 as amended to the House. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. Ayes here to have it. Yeah, it, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Final Mr. Passage. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Latta. Aye. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mrs. McMorse Rogers. Mrs. McMorse Rogers votes aye. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes aye. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes aye. Mr. Cassidy. Aye. Mr. Cassidy votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes aye. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes aye. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes aye. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes aye. Mr. Bill Rockus. Mr. Bill Rockus votes aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes aye. Mr. Long. Mr. Long votes aye. Mrs. Elmers. Mrs. Elmers votes aye. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshu. Ms. Eshu votes no. Mr. Ingle. Mr. Ingle votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mr. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welsh. Mr. Welsh votes no. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Yarmouth votes no. Chairman Upton. Votes aye. Chairman Upton votes aye. Are there other members wishing to cast a vote on this bill as amended? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally.
Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 31 ayes and 19 nays. 31 ayes, uh, 19 nays. The bill as amended is, uh, uh, is, is uh, approved. Uh, and uh, the chair would now call up H.R. 4342 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 4342 to prohibit the National Telecommunications and Information Administration from relinquishing responsibility over the Internet Domain Name System until the Comptroller General of the United States submits to Congress a report on the role of the NTIA with respect to such system. And without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point, so ordered. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Are there any amendments to the bill? Seen where chair would recognize the gentlelady from California to offer an amendment. To Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 4342 offered by Ms. Eshoo. And the amendment will be considered as read. Staff will distribute the amendments, and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't Before think the committee is in order, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady is correct. If, shh. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Uh, leading up to the uh, Wicket Conference in Dubai in 2012, uh, both chambers of Congress unanimously supported a resolution stating that the United States should continue to preserve and advance the multi-stakeholder governance model under which the Internet has thrived. Our diplomats told us that this resolution had an extraordinarily positive impact because it demonstrated to other countries that the entire U.S. government and Congress were unified in support of this approach. As further evidence of our unanimity, the House reaffirmed this position last year by voting 413 to zero in support of H.R. 1580. Now, perhaps some members didn't read what they voted for. The heart of my amendment is verbatim to the operative language in H.R. 1580, and I want to quote it. It's the policy of the United States to preserve and advance the successful multi-stakeholder model that governs the Internet. While I've modified some of the findings to make it germane to the underlying bill and added one finding to make it relevant to this discussion, the core message remains the same. A vote for my amendment is a reaffirmation of the vote that every member of this subcommittee, of, the, uh, of our subcommittee, took last year supporting the multi-stakeholder model. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment to allow NTIA to continue what's been U.S. policy. I don't think that, Mr. Chairman, this is so distracting. Wait, wait. It really the gentlelady is, not... is correct. Jeez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I raise that because, um, really, if people don't want to pay attention to what each member is saying, um, and you haven't read the amendment, then what, how do we make a determination of what the heck we're voting on? So I appreciate it. Um, so while I've modified some of the findings to make it germane to the underlying bill, and added one finding to make it relevant to this discussion, the core message remains the same. A vote for this amendment is a reaffirmation of the vote that every member uh, took last year supporting the multi-stakeholder model. So I urge my colleagues, uh, Republicans and Democrats, to support the amendment and allow NTIA to continue what's been U.S. policy since 1998 transitioning the governmental role in the domain name system administration to the private sector, multi-stakeholder, global community. And I would also ask that um, uh, uh, those members that um, disagree, if you could explain, having voted for it, 
and what has changed your mind? Because we had a vote in the House of 413 to zero. I think it would really be helpful to, uh, to uh, the debate and the discussion here. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back yield the balance. I would be glad to yield to Mr. Engel. Well, I thank the, uh, uh, the gentlewoman for yielding to me, and I, I rise in support of her amendment. Uh, today's economy is becoming more intertwined and more globalized on a daily basis, thanks largely to the Internet. More specifically, it is thanks to the unhindered flow of knowledge that the Internet allows. So, Mr. Chairman, I believe it's essential that we do not pose a hindrance to that flow of information. To suddenly halt the move toward a multi-stakeholder model of Internet governance would be to implement a sudden hurdle to the progress the Internet has long afforded us. So as such, I support Ms. Eshoo's amendment because to maintain the multi-stakeholder model is to maintain the benefits that the Internet offers. I, I, yield, I, just want to put something I yield back to Ms. Eshoo. Mr. Chairman, I, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record um, a letter uh, that is addressed to both you and Ranking Member Waxman uh, from um, CCIA, the Computer and Communications Industry Association, uh, representing a wide range of technology companies that are dependent on a well-functioning Internet free of government control or censorship. So I ask unanimous consent to place this in the record, and I yield back the balance of my time. Without objection, it will be included as part of the record. Uh, mem Chair would recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, you know, I appreciate my colleagues. I work very closely with Anna on numerous things. Uh, also, Elliot in the in in the committee, but also in international affairs. Uh, so I don't, you know, take this debate lightly. And I think we just need to continue to talk because um, the question is posed: What's changed? I I would argue Russia's invasion of Crimea. Um, I, would ar I would argue Turkey's control of the Twitter feeds. I would argue that the world's significantly different today than it was when the WICA conference uh, w met. And as, through, as we've moved this process through, I've been kind of unabashed, and I know there's, there's differing views. Um, so what we tried to do was uh, even uh, the, the head of ICANN said we need to go slow. We need to do due diligence. We need to have transparency. Um, this is just an audit. <laughs> this is just a review. This is just an attempt for us to get some definitional language. When you talk to industry, which I have great respect for, um, they'll say this is an industry-led, multi-stakeholder model. When you hear Vladimir Putin, what does he say? He says this will be an international, country-led, multi-stakeholder model. So you know, the question I pose is, what is it? And the answer is, we can't get a definition. We don't know. So that's why I have colleagues on our side that would like to be a, even more stringent on this process, an outright prohibition. Um, we are trying to believe what the process in which we thought we were heading, again, in a different era and a different world environment. So that's why we said trust but verify. Let's have a uh, nonpartisan GAO do an analysis. Um, doesn't stake out what that position will be. Doesn't uh, determine what our response will be. Uh, there is time. It's due diligence. Uh, and I guess we'll get a chance to talk about this numerous times throughout this amendment process. But I, I know my friends on the other side, you know, have seen me try to legislate for many, many years. I mean, this is not, I'm, I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, to, to blow up the process. I'm just trying to say it doesn't hurt to look and ease fears when the world has significantly changed. I would be happy to yield. I thank the gentleman, and um, in no way do I question uh, your motives. You're a good friend and a good colleague. Let me just comment on, um, uh, on uh, the changes, uh, the menacing changes that we see in different parts of the uh, world and actions taken by governments that we don't agree with. Um, uh, what is the key in this is that this um, 
uh, uh, the progress toward this transition to a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, model is supported by democratic governments. And so this strengthens the hand of those that we want to hold hands with. It's not the other way around. And I, I think that that's a very, very important consideration for colleagues to make. So uh, I, th I, I thank the gentleman for what uh, he has said. Obviously, we don't agree, but uh, there are other parts of this uh, um, that we have, uh, we have worked out. But uh, I, I just, um, well, let me just leave it there, and I thank you for No, and I, and I appreciate it. We're claiming our time. I appreciate those kind words. And uh, I would point out um, yesterday in, in talking to a group, I had the Freedom House uh, charts of Internet freedom by country. And I would just pose the fact that most countries are listed as less free or not free than free. So if you move to a multi-stakeholder model and you, and you have more countries involved that are either less free or not free, uh, I think there's a risk there. I don't think it's asking too much to uh, give us some more uh, confidence. And with that, um, my, I will yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jen, uh, gentleman yields back show to recognize the gentleman from California for, uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, support the issue amendment. I think it's an excellent substitute because it reaffirms our support for the multi-stakeholder model. And that, by the way, is not a partisan position. Uh, this has been the position, it's a linchpin of U.S. policy through the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations, and it's the entire rationale for having ICANN in the first place. I, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that we put into the record uh, a memorandum prepared by our staff regarding the Republican statements of support of the multi-stakeholder model. Without objection. Reserving the right to object only if there is a, my statements included in there. So uh, I hope there's a statement from me saying that I supported that when it came to the floor. Well, Just the, joking. The document I obviously, itself. without objection. Thank you. The, um, the NTIA's recent transition announcement is part of a 16-year-long effort to move management of the domain name system away from governments and into the private sector. And this objective has been bipartisan. The uh, diplomats who have fought hard to preserve Internet freedom from governmental control in global forums tell us that having this transition is a critical continuation of our efforts to build upon the success of the multi-stakeholder model of Internet governance. And we should stand united in support of this transition and reaffirm our commitment to this model within this ne new context. And Ms. Eshoo's amendment offers an, an opportunity uh, to do precisely that. Uh, we've heard the specter of uh, Russia or China taking over the Internet. The threats against Internet openness are real. But claiming this bill does anything to address them is plain false. Under what possible scenario would the supposed Chinese Internet takeover be stopped by a bill that seeks to delay the end of the IANA pro contract? How exactly would GAO's examination help convince Russia to give up its attempts to wrestle away control from ICANN? Those are my colleagues who support this bill either show a lack of understanding of what the NTIA contract actually does or a lack of confidence in the multi-stakeholder multi model and its ability to resist uh, governmental control. Both serve to weaken our role on the global stage, not to strengthen it. The best defense we can have against a governmental takeover of the domain name system is to empower our allies in the multi-stakeholder process. And now is the time to continue our unwavering support of that model. I highly uh, doubt that human rights and civil society groups, multinational corporations, academics and engineers, as well as freedom-loving nations who participate in ICANN's deliberative process will reverse course and throw themselves into the hands of any intergovernmental entity, not to mention Iran or Venezuela. 
So I, that's why I strongly urge my colleagues to support the issue amendment, reaffirming our commitment to the multi-stakeholder model through an official policy statement of the United States. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, Chair. Recognize gentleman from Oregon, Mr. I Walden. thank the chairman very much, and I appreciate the debate we're having. Although I have to confess, I, I don't fully understand the opposition to this uh, legislation. What we're dealing with here is something that's extraordinarily important uh, to the future of freedom of the internet. Um, I've got the contract before me uh, that the United States government has in force and effect uh, with ICANN. Um, I've read through it multiple times and it says things such as the contractor must perform the required services for this contract as a prime contractor, not as an agent or subcontractor. The contractor shall not enter any subcontracts, et cetera, et cetera. It has to be a wholly owned and operated firm or fully accredited to the United States University or College operating in one of the 50 states, the United States or District of Columbia, incorporated within one of the 50 states or, the, or District of Columbia, organized under the laws of the United States. This is all existing contract with ICANN. Further, if you go to Section 1 of the contract clauses, are all the, <coughs> by reference, clauses of, <coughs> pardon me, existing law regarding restrictions on subcontractor sales to the government, anti-kickback procedures, limitations on payments to influence certain federal transactions. I mean, there's a whole list of these. This is the way the system works today. This is the way the system works today. And all we're saying here is before ICANN and whoever comes together and releases ICANN or wherever the future contractor is from all of these things that have been in place and are in place today, why wouldn't we get an independent look from the GAO about what that proposal, which none of us here today knows what it is, why don't we get GAO to take a look before any actions are taken by the United States government, inform the Congress and the American people from their view, and I think we all have pretty good faith and trust in the GAO's independence and integrity and ability, have them take a look at whatever the proposal is that comes forward and give us the benefit of their view before the government and whatever administration happens to be in power at the time takes action. That's but, all we're saying here. But the gentleman you? No, not, not yet. I'd be happy to in a moment. But that's all we're saying here is if you come up with a proposal before the federal government of the United States says, we're all for it, you're done, gone, let's just find out what it means, give us a pause, they, we give them appropriate time to do their study, and, and then we move forward. But meanwhile, when you read the contract, and I would, I would encourage my colleagues to do it, there are a lot of really responsible provisions in the contract mm -hmm. that have worked well for ICANN. And before we set it free, I think we have an obligation to know as much as we can about whatever proposal this is that we don't know today, because it has not been negotiated yet. We don't know. Nobody on this panel knows. And what we're saying is, can we just stop a minute and get GAO to take a look before an action is taken by the federal government? Most likely, it won't be the Obama administration. For my friends on the right, uh, for my friends on the left, I want you to think through what if it's a uh, Republican administration, how you might react to that. All we're saying is let's get a GAO report after we get a proposal back. Because once you let go of this, it's the equivalent of going to the ridgetop in a high wind, cutting a pillow open, the feathers blow away. You will never put them back in the pillow. I asked that during our hearings. I've asked that. What, what's our recourse once we let this go? Nobody knows because we don't know the government structure and the proposal yet. I, I just think it's highly irresponsible and, and, and in effect I, just to say we're done, have at it, whatever you come up with is fine. We don't want any time to consider it. Government, whoever's in charge, go forth. We're fine. I know we trust you and everything will be well. I don't buy that. I don't buy that. And so I, uh, I think we have a very thoughtful, responsible piece of legislation here authored by my friend and colleague from Illinois that just says, GAO, once we get a proposal, take a look. Give us your independent view of it. That's it. That's all it does. I think that's pretty reasonable and thoughtful and responsible. So with that, I would yield to my friend from California.
Mrs. Escher. I, I, I think I'm not going to take this limited amount of time, but I appreciate it. I think someone else is going to yield their time to then me. Then I claim my time and uh, in opposition to uh, the amendment. And I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. I would recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. And I yield to Ms. Escher. I thank the gentleman. Um, for the members that are not on the subcommittee, uh, we have had uh, this debate there, and so now you're hearing it in the full committee. Um, the, uh, uh, the gentleman from Oregon has made a passionate and um, he believes, uh, obviously, uh, a, a rational uh, presentation on, um, on, uh, uh, on why uh, he opposes this amendment. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to point out about this. Uh, it mentioned the GAO report about um, five or seven times at least. And it's presented as something that is um, very tidy without any menace to it whatsoever. But it's not. It's not. Because what is tied to the language in the GAO report is to simply tie up the hands of uh, NTIA, of the agency, so that nothing can happen. So it's not just the GAO looking at something and giving a report back to us. And so that throws sand in the gears in terms of what you all voted for, 413 to zero, a bipartisan effort. This is not something new, my colleagues. This has been the exact policy, as Mr. Waxman said, of three administrations, Clinton, Bush, Obama. The Congress has weighed in on it. I don't know where these suspicions have come from, that there's some black helicopter, something or other in this. Um, uh, it is very disturbing to me that as we come to the time where the, uh, the, the process is supposed to move forward, that regardless of what you have said, and there are all of these quotes, including Mr. Walden, Lee Terry, um, uh, Mr. Walden, Mr. Scalise, uh, uh, Marsha Blackburn, all praising the very process that we are referring to today. I, I don't know what has entered your minds that has uh, uh, have you make a U-turn, but the GAO report is not, with all due respect to uh, Mr. Walden, uh, the way it's been described. This process is not opening, tearing open a, um, a pillow and letting uh, uh, feathers go to the wind and that we allow uh, dark governments that are non-democratic to take over the Internet. Who amongst us would be for that? That is, that is a, a, a terrible charge uh, against any member of Congress. That's not who and what we are. We are proud Americans, we are patriots, and we have a responsibility to our national security. So um, uh, I'd be glad to. So uh, I, I, let me just close by saying um, uh, what Mr. Walden said sounds like it's uh, 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 not menacing, but what's buried in the words of this um, of this legislation are, are really being misrepresented, I believe, uh, because it's, it's not what it's about. I'll yield to Mr. Uh, with, Waxman. With, with, thank you very much for yielding. Uh, Mr. Walden said we could trust GAO, but this underlying bill without the issue amendment says we don't trust everybody that's been working on, the, on this process, and we don't trust the, our own NTIA, and we don't trust Congress to come back and review it before it goes into effect. We haven't delegated everything to others. We still have an opportunity, if, it, if it's unacceptable, to uh, take action to prevent something from happening. But it, it sends a signal that we don't trust anybody but a GAO. Oh. And I, 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 uh, it's, it's not just a holding pattern. It sends the wrong message and undermines uh, the very idea of, uh, of a, a multi-stakeholder uh, process. Thank you for your opening. Gentlelady yields back. Chair would recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. I yield to, yield to Mr. Walden. 
I thank the gentleman from yielding it, uh, for yielding, and I'm, I'm sort of stunned uh, by the, the attacks coming toward me because the plain language of the bill says something different. It says this in line three, retention of responsibilities. Until the con Comptroller General of the United States submits the report required by subsection B, the Assistant Secretary of Communication, Commerce for Communication and Information may not relinquish or agree to any proposed proposal relating to the relinquishment of the responsibility of NTIA over Internet domain name system functions. Okay, so it says you can't do anything once you get the proposal until we hear from the GAO. In line 15, it says GAO has one year. No more than one year, not later than one year after the date on which NTIA receives a proposal relating to the relinquishment of the responsibility of NTIA over Internet domain name system functions that was developed in the process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they have to go through and do this analysis for us and for the American people. Now, let's talk about how onerous this is. A discussion and analysis of the advantages and disadvantages of the relinquishment of the responsibility of NTIA over Internet domain name system functions, including responsibility with respect to the authoritative root zone file, Internet assigned numbers authority functions, and related root zone management functions. Okay, what's the new proposal do to that? I guess nobody wants to know. B, any principles or criteria that the NTIA sets for proposals for such relinquishment. C, each proposal received by NTIA for such relinquishment. D, the processes used by NTIA and the federal agencies for evaluating such proposals. E, any national security concerns raised by such relinquishment. And two, a definition of the term multi-stakeholder model is used by the NTIA with respect to Internet policy making and governments and definitions and any other terms necessary to understand the matters covered by the report. That's the entire scope of the questions to GAO. In short, it says, before NTIA does whatever they want to do, and by the way, if they got a report, if they got a proposal in, tell me where in statute today it says Congress gets the first bite at the apple. It's not there. What this administration's proposing says, in effect, we can decide, and we can cut it free regardless of what Congress may or may not think, and without the benefit of an independent look from the Government Accountability Office. And by the way, within the contract that already controls operations of ICANN is the GAO. They have the right to audit today. This is just absurd that somehow we're against the multi-stakeholder process. Somehow we have no confidence in that because we want the GAO to evaluate some new proposal that upends the entire history of management of uh, the, the, uh, this process. Gentlemen, yield to me. And so I, I take offense to some of the charges coming our way, frankly, um, because all we're saying is let's get a GAO report. Can't take more than a year. Tell us the facts. Give us your opinion. It doesn't delegate authority to the GAO. It doesn't do anything other than say halt to the federal government. Let's find out the implications of this new proposal. That, by the way, would give Congress an opportunity to weigh in when we get the report. I'd be happy to yield for the gentleman from California. Well, my, my question to you is, what do we need the bill for? Uh, there, there's going to be, we could always well, get simple, a GAO Well, simple, reclaiming report. my time. There's going to be an opportunity for hearings and evaluation. Why do we need to stop the process? Well, reclaiming my time, I'll answer the question. Because there's nothing in statute today that gives Congress that opportunity. The government could act, absent Congress, just like that, and say we're all for this new idea of how to run this, and we're out of time, and they already enter into a new agreement and cut it free. Where is it in statute that prevents the government from acting before we have a chance to evaluate? Shouldn't the Congress, shouldn't this great committee have the opportunity before an unelected agency operates to have our shot at it, to, to get independent information? I mean, we're talking years out there probably before they come to us with a proposal, and I think it just makes sense. I, I, if it were my business, I'd say I want to know the implications of this in a timely manner before I cut this loose. Remember, we created, through ARPA, the Internet. The United States government and our great institutions of higher learning created this. We have embraced the multi-stakeholder process. We, when I'm willing to do that, I've supported these resolutions. 
But all we're saying here is can we at least know what happens when you cut this loose? And again, I would suggest go read the contract. There are lots of good things in there that have worked well that have given us the free and open Internet we have today. We're taking blind trust to say go figure it out, bureaucrats, do whatever you want, see you later. We're just saying let's get an independent report. Gentlemen's time has expired. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from California. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Roll call vote is requested. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Murphy. No. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mrs. McMorris Rogers. Mrs. McMorris Rogers votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes no. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes no. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Bill Rockus. Mr. Bill Rockus votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Long votes no. Mrs. Elmers. Mrs. Elmers votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Ingle. Mr. Ingle votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Yarmouth votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. Other members wishing to vote? Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise votes no. Are the members wishing to cast a vote? Seeing none. Oh, Mr. Griffith, have you, are you recorded? Uh, seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 21 ayes and 28 nays. 21 ayes, 28 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title. Amendment to H.R. 4342 offered by Mr. Doyle. The amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would instruct the comp Comptroller General to examine the history of the U.S. government efforts to promote the multi-stakeholder model and privatize the administration of the domain main system, as well as examining the transition proposal for the IANA contract. This is the same amendment that I offered during subcommittee markup on this bill. I want to say I am open to working with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle on a GAO study examining these issues, but I strongly oppose provisions in this bill that would tie NTIA's hands and unnecessarily delay this process. Now, we have heard supporters of the Dot-Com Act claim that this is just about Congress requesting a GAO report and that Democrats are opposing transparency in the way NTIA transitions management of the donor name system. I appreciate my colleagues' concern that authoritarian regimes may try to hijack any form or process related to Internet governance. But it is precisely because of these concerns that we must recommit to the multi-stakeholder model. 
All of us want to see the successful bottom-up approach to Internet governance continue. Last month at the Net Mundial meeting in Brazil, stakeholders from around the world representing governments, companies, academics, institutions, civil society, and users discussed the future of Internet governance. This diverse group came together and adopted a statement in support of the multi-stakeholder approach. Delaying this transition allows anti-democratic nations to continue to use the IANA contract as a red herring to falsely claim the U.S. government controls the Internet and argue for a greater role for government entities like the United Nations. We're playing right into the bad guy's hands by trying to pass this bill today. NTIA's transition process will make it clear once and for all that this is not the case. However, I understand my colleagues across the aisle have concerns about this process. So, my amendment preserves a role for GAO to analyze a transition plan put forward by the global community. What it does not do, however, is allow the GAO report be used as a restriction on NTIA's authority or an artificial excuse for delay. We have heard concerns from supporters of the multi-stakeholder model that the DOPCOM Act is at odds with the long-standing American commitment to a global Internet free from government control. The underlying bill reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of the U.S. government's role in Internet management. The technical functions of the Internet domain name system have never been controlled by the U.S. government. Let me say that again. The technical functions of the Internet domain name system have never been controlled by the U.S. government. The bill refers to the relinquishment of the responsibility of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration over Internet domain name system functions. The NTIA has no legal or statutory responsibility for the management of the Internet domain system. The Internet is governed by the technology that allows it to operate and the companies, institutions, governments, and users that connect, deliver, and create content online. The United States has never been able to dictate to other countries how they operate the Internet within their own borders. Any argument that the United States controls all of this is misguided. This is a common sense amendment that would produce a GAO study that would inform the Congress and enhance the multi-stakeholder governance model for the global Internet that we have all supported for many years. I would urge my colleagues to support this amendment. And I yield back. Gentlemen. Oh. Gentlemen, yield back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Oregon. I thank the gentleman, and I appreciate his comments. I'll I want to say a couple of things. One, um, this reminds me of a former speaker who said we had to pass something so we could find out what was in it. This is a lot like that. NTIA, you can go ahead and adopt this, and then we'll allow a GAO report to figure out what the implications are. And I think that's kind of uh, the wrong approach, obviously. So it sort of eviscerates the purpose of the bill, which is before NTIA acts, that we get the GAO to just look and tell us within a year's time, by statute, what are the implications of whatever proposal comes forward. Now, as to the U.S. role in all of this, in a, uh, in a presentation with ICANN and an introduction to IANA dated September 29th of 2008, this is their own documents now I'm reading from, uh, it says with the U.S. government and IANA, today the IANA is administered under the terms of a contract between ICANN and the U.S. government. IANA is not a legal entity itself, rather a set of functions performed by the IANA, IANA department within ICANN. The contract stipulates the scope of the IANA services, as well as defines reporting requirements for ICANN on how it administers the IANA functions. ICANN is required to report on a monthly basis to the U.S. government on how it's administering requests relating to all the contract-related facets of IANA. This is from ICANN. Quote, with respect to the operation of the DNS root zone, the U.S. government has a more direct role in authorizing all changes before they are implemented. In practice, this means that once IANA has completed processing of a change request to the root zone, it's sent to the U.S. government to review. After this review and their authorization is received, it is then implemented in the DNS root zone. So uh, I've, I've, I referenced the contract before. I'm now reading from ICANN's own presentation notes about how the process works and the interaction with the federal government of the United States. Now, we may well move to this 
multi-stakeholder process. The, the point is, before we release this piece that's worked so well for so long, let's figure out what the new proposal looks like, because nobody on either side of the aisle can tell us, are there any requirements where the future ICANN will be domiciled? Under which country's laws will it be governed? Will the provisions that have made it work today be there to make it work tomorrow? We don't know because there is no proposal before us. All we're saying as Republicans on this side of the aisle and with some of our help from our friends on the other side is can't we just say once you get a proposal, NTIA, pause, GAO, give us your evaluation of this independent, high integrity organization already involved by contract in ICANN. Tell us what this means. It doesn't say you can't go forward after that. But it would give Congress a chance to digest, the American people a chance to digest, the world community a chance to digest, whatever this new proposal is. Because once this contract's gone, I don't see the provision of how you ever get it back. So we better get it right and know every possible bit of information we can find before uh, a few folks downtown here make a decision and it's gone. So I, uh, I yield back the balance of, of my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair would recognize the gentlelady from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Doyle for his amendment. I think it's spot on uh, because it does instruct the GAO to examine the history of, uh, of uh, our government's uh, efforts to promote the multi-stakeholder model and transition the administration of the domain name system to the private sector. Um, boy, uh, there is um, like a lot of noise in the room. I, I, I just... Um, it really kind of takes my breath away. There are facts that we all need to appreciate. We've had U.S. policy from 1998 to this very moment to transition the government's role. I, I don't know why the Republicans don't embrace this because it is all about transitioning the role to the private sector. Um, and that's what... Um, uh, 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 this, uh, this speaks to. Uh, for those in need of a history lesson, the Doyle Amendment provides a thorough examination into the U.S. government's role in Internet governance, and it would do so without undermining the legitimacy of the multi-stakeholder process. And this should be more than sufficient to alleviate all of these fears of a Chinese government takeover or whatever. I, I don't know where this stuff has come from, but Boy, is it out there, and um, uh, I, I, I don't think it really adds anything to this, and it's a total U-turn on, uh, on how people, uh, members, have voted. So very importantly for everyone to appreciate, I think, is that Mr. Doyle's amendment demonstrates that uh, uh, our side of the aisle does not uh, oppose, is that we're not opposed to greater transparency and a review of the history that got us to this point. And uh, that's why I thank him for the amendment. I think it's a solid one, and I would urge my colleagues to uh, support it. And with that, I uh, yield back. General Aidy yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Mr. Chairman? S gentleman from New Mexico. I uh, move to strike the last word. I echo the concerns that both Ms. Eshoo and Mr. Doyle uh, have both raised today. Congress beating its chest and claiming a unilateral right to supervise global Internet infrastructure could further mobilize support among the world's governments for a more nationalistic approach to Internet management. In fact, a number of the bill supporters have voiced this very concern. Um, I'm glad that we're hearing that some of my colleagues are asking that their statements be entered into the record and be included as part of uh, this debate. I'd like to read a few of those quotes. Uh, one, quote, we need, a, we need to send a strong message to the world that the Internet has thrived under a decentralized, bottom-up, multi-stakeholder governance that. model, end quote. Uh, quote, and part of their, referring to the Internet technology company's success, the fact that they are growing so big in a tough economy is because we have got this multi-stakeholder governance that you are not having to worry about government interference from country to country, end quote. Quote. The Internet will only continue to thrive if governments refrain from regulating it and if it can remain under a multi-stakeholder Excuse me, Mr. Governance Chairman, the model. committee is not in order. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you want me to repeat those quotes, Mr. Chairman, or should I just go on? We got them. Oh, God, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> the announcement by NTIA last month was precisely the kind of measure that will help alleviate this risk. Yet the bill we are considering today seeks to undermine that effort and is contrary to the longstanding support of this committee by both parties, 413 to zero for the global multi-stakeholder model. In so doing, we play into our opponent's narrative that the United States prefers a unilateral role exercising control over the internet in practice, and our support for the multi-stakeholder model is nothing more than lip service. I think the country's tired of that. Adding to my confusion on this legislation are my colleagues' attempts to equate the FCC's net neutrality rules with government censorship in the same breath that they cite governmental efforts to censor online content as part of their motivation for advancing this bill. Net neutrality actually protects free speech and our democratic disc discourse online. In fact, an instance of a wireless carrier blocking political speech over text messages is one of the instances that demonstrated the need for these rules in the first place. Our domestic and international policy goals should be exactly the same, promoting a free and open internet that is accessible to all. We have voted three times over the past two years in support of a multi-stakeholder model, but as soon as the administration takes a step forward, stake, takes a step toward fulfilling that vision, my Republican colleagues are suddenly opposed. Instead of working together to promote a free internet, the House majority has only rehashed tired partisan talking points against President Obama and promoted yet another conspiracy theory in a week that's already seen many. These amendments are modeled after the policy statement that the House has already passed unanimously, 413 to zero, in support of a multi-stakeholder approach to internet governments. It is important and more effective than the dot-com act in expressing our unambiguous opposition to efforts by countries like Russia and Iran to control and censor the internet. I hope we can find a way to get through this, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you know, we, we know what the numbers are here today. My, one of the early lessons my father taught me in life was how to count, and clearly we can see what numbers will yield today, but in an effort to get to where we hopefully can be, um, in an effort where the Congress has agreed on this, I hope there's still well, some room for us to work well, together. Well, would, the gentleman, the would the gentleman yield? I would. Thing? I would yeah. yield I, to my chairman. You know, I, we have no problem with this addition in terms of what the GAO could look at. We could probably accept this as a secondary amendment to a new section and add it to the finding, you know, add it to the request of the GAO. If the issue is about getting more information on ICANN, NTIA, and all that, I think that could be acceptable as a secondary amendment, create a new, uh, to Section 3, we could, we've got counsel at the table that could tell us how to do that. Well, Mr. Chairman, that be my time, the not being the author of the amendment, I'd have to uh, refer back to uh, my uh, ranking member and the author of the amendment, but I appreciate the words of my chairman on the subcommittee. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back balance my time. Gentleman yields back. Are the members wishing to speak on the amendment? Gen lady from Tennessee. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know that we have many members that are wanting to move away from the hearing and get on to other events, but I think that as we listen to the debate, one of the things that is worth putting uh, in bold print is the fact that we are moving forward in a structure that is basically trust but verify. And it is an important step for this committee to take. As we talk with our constituents, as we talk with innovators who are utilizing the internet, as we talk with companies and deal with the issues of privacy and data security, one of the things that concerns them is what the posture of uh, ICANN would be a decade from now, two decades from now, and where that would be housed, what country, and as Mr. Walden said, under whose rules would this operate? We are a nation that treasures and values free speech, and be, the Internet has been well served by that grounding, and because of that, it is vitally important that we carefully approach this, that we have a full review, and that come back to us. Mr. Shimkus has done great work on this, as has Mr. Rakita, 
I've been pleased to work with them. And of course, uh, Chairman Walden continues to be vigilant. And we would be wise to slow down, take a thorough review, and realize that once it's gone, it's gone. With that, Mr. Walden, did you want additional time? You're good. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Are there further members uh, wishing to speak on the amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Roll call vote is requested. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Barton. No. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts votes no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mrs. McMorris Rogers. Mrs. McMorris Rogers. Mr. Mrs. McMorris Rogers votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Lance. Oh, sorry. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes no. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Bill Rockus. Mr. Bill Rockus votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mrs. Elmers. Mrs. Elmers votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Aye. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Ingle. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Oh, aye. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Yarmouth votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. The member who switched to cast a vote, Mr. Long. Mr. Long votes no. Dr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes no. Is Ms. Kathy McMorris, Ms. McMorris Rogers? She's voted. Uh, other members wishing to cast a vote? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 20 ayes and 30 nays. 20 ayes, 30 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 4342 to the House. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably reported. The chair now calls up H.R. 4572 and asks the clerk to report. H.R. 4572, to amend the Communications Act of 1934 to extend expiring provisions relating to the retransmission of signals of television broadcast stations and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered. The chair now recognizes Mr. Gardner for the purpose of offering an amendment. Uh, thank you, Chairman Upton, uh, Chairman Walden, and thank you, Mr. Lujan. I appreciate the opportunity to offer the Gardner Amendment, which I do so at, Clerk, at this Clerk time. Clerk will report the title of the amendment. Gardner-Lujan Amendment, excuse me. Amendment to H.R. 4572 offered by Mr. Gardner of Colorado and Mr. Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico. The, amem the amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the uh, gentleman from Colorado will be recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Andy, bless that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, I thank, uh, thank the Chairman and uh, yeah. Chairman Walden and Mr. Lujan for working together on this amendment today. Uh, 
I commend everyone in this room and all of the industry from work, for working hard to get a product today that works for everyone and gets us on a path to fixing a concern that I've worked on in the state legislature and continue to now. As many of you know, as, as many of you know uh, there are two counties in southwest Colorado that only receive Albuquerque local stations because of Nielsen's DMA lines. As you can imagine, these customers value local programming that comes from the their... The gentleman suspend. I, I think they've uh, circulated a Lujan Gardner amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was wondering what uh, the change had been. So we'll reset the clock. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Mexico seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the title of the amendment again. Amendment to H.R. 4572 offered by Mr. Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico and Mr. Gardner of Colorado. And without objection, the gentleman from New Mexico is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, over the past decade, American consumers have enjoyed an explosion of new options for viewing video content traditional services such as over-the-air broadcast cable and satellite companies have been joined by new alternatives such as over-the-top content internet protocol television and other services depending upon broadband providers uh, despite these new technological innovations television viewers remain limited to broadcasts that are intended for their designated market areas or dmas the FCC has delegated the role of defining these DMAs to the Nielsen Company, a privately held for-profit marketing research company that claims to have never sought this power. Nielsen has divided up the country into separate DMAs based upon the reach of stations, antiquated broadcast antennas, these uh, antennas which were considered cutting-edge technology back in the 1950s, which are now relied on by a much smaller population, inexplicably continue to determine the broadcast stations available at any given location in the country. My amendment would allow the FCC to embrace the future of broadcasting and to explore the possibilities of cutting-edge technologies. With the broadband connection, viewers can watch an almost infinite amount of on-demand video online with a smartphone, tablet, or other mobile device. They can watch this content from a Wi-Fi hotspot or virtually anywhere with wireless service. Through the Internet, consumers can listen to radio signals from around the globe, but Nielsen's maps of almost obsolete antenna networks continue to block consumers from accessing programming from outside of their DMAs. It's time to begin preparing for new ways to define broadcasting markets that are based upon the newest technologies. My amendment builds upon a study of DMAs commissioned by the last Stella bill in 2010 to require the FCC to update its earlier efforts and to explore how new broadcasting markets could be created if they were based upon the potential of current and future technologies instead of limitations of aging broadcast antennas. I offered my amendment uh, and withdrew it at markup in the subcommittee in order to get additional insight and support from the broadcast, satellite, and cable industries. And I understand I now have a co-sponsor on the amendment as well. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and embrace a more vibrant future for the video marketplace. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time, uh, and uh, are there other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, my colleague, Mr. Luan, from New Mexico for his work on this amendment, and something that we've been working on in Colorado for some time in the state legislature is here and here as well. Uh, two southwest Colorado counties only receive Albuquerque local stations because of Nielsen's uh, DMA lines. As you can imagine, these customers value local programming that comes from their home state, both local news and their local sports teams. Uh, they want to watch Colorado programming, which I think everyone in this room can understand. As Mr. Lujan stated, our amendment does two simple things, asks for a report with an analysis of which consumers are watching broadcast programming outside their local markets, and two, it asks for information on whether there are technologically and economically feasible alternatives to the use of DMAs in order to provide consumers with more programming options. By requiring the Commission to produce this report, we'll be providing necessary information to industry, government, and consumers about how vast the problem actually is and how best we can fix it. And I look forward to working with Mr. Lujan and others on this issue as we move forward. And I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs and the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Mexico. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question
question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 4572 as amended to the House. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Meaning the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the bill is favorably reported. Without objection, staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the legislation reported by the committee today. So ordered. And without objection, the committee stands adjourned.